All right, guys, welcome to my house in beautiful Santa Barbara, California. And one of the things that I get asked the most about is a pet tour. So come and check it out and I'll show you all of our critters. All right, so over here, I have two very, very special snakes to me. These are my rosy boas. And you can see they're two very, very different boas. Um, this one here, which is Rosie. And Rosie was my first pet when I moved to the United States. And the reason being, uh, once I moved to California, I heard about native boas in California and I cruised down to Palm Springs area. And the very first boa I found was this boa right here. And she had a gnarly, fleshy, like infected tail. And I wasn't planning on keeping a snake, but I, I grabbed her and I was like, wow, this snake could easily go septic if I don't do something about it. And so I brought her back to Santa Barbara the next day trimmed off all the dead flesh, treated it with betadine, gave her antibiotics, and she healed up. And at that time, I was 15 years old, and I used to take her in for show and tell. And then when I was in college, I started a little business called Adventure Science, and this was always my display animal. And the whole time, I'd be messing with her tail, whatever, she never bit me once. So Rosie, I've had for 18 years, no, nearly 20 years. Um, and she's amazing, and I got her a friend, not much later, who's chocolate. And what I love about these two is these are not hypo, crazy bred rosy boas. This is a native boa from the northernmost extent of their range in Palm Springs, California. And this is from the southernmost at Cabo San Lucas, the very tip. And you can see the crazy different color variations. And what's so cool is how they shift from this color to this color as you go down south. Um, and I even caught one pretty recently when we went to Baja and filmed the taxa thing and the purple colors on that one were crazy and really a, a mix of these two, but of course I'm not collecting snakes. But these are two of my absolute favorite animals. Rosie I've had for almost as long as I've been in America and chocolate for about 10, 12 years and they live here very happily. Um, below them, the newest addition to the farm, if you will, is my son's pet. So my son is three and a half years old. He's not here today, thankfully, because he is nuts when there's a camera around. And um, the very, very first snake that he caught all by himself, we went up to the park near to my house, and I said, go look under that tin, and if there's a rattlesnake under there, stay away, but if it's not a rattlesnake, catch it, whatever it is. And he was tentative, he's only three years old. And so as he lifted up the tin, this little guy was sitting right under it. And this is Baby Goaf. Baby Goaf, the Baby Gopher snake. And uh, when we found Baby Goaf, he was about this big. He was probably six days old. And I said to my son, this is a good opportunity for you to learn. You're allowed to collect these animals. I don't condone taking animals from the wild. And I said, here's what we'll do. This was only the spring. It was about a month and a half ago. And I said, we'll take them home. We'll build them a nice habitat. We'll feed them up and get them nice and fat. And then we'll release them in the garden so that baby goaf can be big goaf and eat the gophers that hang out and chill, chew up our lawn. So Rose is really excited because we're using baby goaf as pest control once he's big enough to be released. Um, so for now, he lives in this very cool little habitat that Rhodes set up all by himself with this really cool like Zoomed clay stuff and this nice bark. And um, yeah, he's a very happy snake whose life is way too easy compared to being a wild snake. But, not the most exotic creature in the world, but something that Rhodes absolutely adores, and I would say Baby Goaf gets played with, on average, four times a day. <laughs> so, that's Baby Goaf. Speaking of my son, Rhodes, and his pets, if you come over here to his room, he loves everything to do with animals, way more interested in it than sports or anything else, which is fine, hopefully he'll play rugby when he gets older, but. If he's obsessed with animals his whole life and grows up to care about conservation, that's a win. So in here, we have a little dual species tank. Again, not something I would typically suggest, but these two have lived together since, um, since Rhodes was born and been very, very happy together. In fact, they kind of cuddle up. Actually, they are cuddling up if you look right here. Right now, uh, I've now given Gizzard a bit of a fright, but until then, they were together. So this is Gizzard the lizard. And Gizzard is an Indonesian blue tongue skink. You hear him hissing. The only person he doesn't hiss for is Rhodes. Rhodes picks him up, totally chill. Me or his mom pick him up, he does this little like, leave me alone, I don't feel like being played with. But Gizzard's great, he mostly eats dog food. Um, like a lot of our pets, he was a rescue. When we got contacted 
The people who had him were like, we have this Australian blue tongue skink and he's miserable. His eyes keep getting glued shut. All his fingers have uh, rotten, basically rotted off and dried up with the skin. And I was like, all right, let me see what's going on. Just assuming that it was bad husbandry. And it was, but not for the reason you're thinking. I took him in, I was like, let me try and fix him up. And I realized pretty quickly, he's not an Australian blue tongue skink. He's an Indonesian, which means he doesn't like dry desert conditions. He likes wet, humid, tropical conditions. And so he was being kept in these dry conditions to simulate the outback and he was having major shedding problems, which is what led to him losing all of his toes and his eyelids getting pretty messed up. But he's really ha happy and healthy now. We've had him for years and he lives, go back for a sec, is with another rescue, Davis. Davis is our Eastern box turtle who uh, was found walking around West Hollywood by our friend Allegra Davis. And Eastern box turtles are not supposed to be in California. They're certainly not supposed to be walking around the streets of West Hollywood. She found him, she called us and said, what do we do? I said, look, put up some posters. See if, Davis, look buddy. See if uh, anybody wants him. See if anybody wants to come and get him. And uh, after a week of posters being up, nobody claimed him. Allegra couldn't keep him. So she brought him over here and we really didn't need any more turtles or tortoises as you can imagine and you will see as we walk around. And so we threw Davis in with Gizzard to see how they do. They both like humid, they both like wet, they both eat a lot of the same food even though he's choosing not to right now. And um, we put him in here and he's been very happy living with Gizzard the lizard ever since. All right, and over here I have my juvenile turtle tank. So I actually have four stages of turtle tanks. It's a lot, I love turtles. I did a lot of my undergraduate work on turtles. They're just my favorite, basically. Um, and so I have a, a hatchling hatchling tank for tinies, which I'll show you up in my office. Then I have the babies, which are these guys, which are my favorites. Um, and then I have the sub-adults, and then out in the pond I have the adults. So this is my baby's tank. So I have a bunch of different turtles in here. Two soft shells. This one's very special. This is called a leopard soft shell. He's a hybrid between a Florida and a spiny. Two uh, North American species that hybridize to make this leopard looking soft shell. Very, very cool. Um, and a lot of these turtles came from uh, Sean at Dark Hammock Turtles. He breeds these guys, which are unbelievable. These are these hypo cooters. So he takes all these Florida cooters and breeds them for these crazy colors. Typically, I'm a natural guy. I like animals that look natural. I'm not a big fan of those bred for crazy colors. But Sean sent me this guy. He's like, they're so much fun. They're such cute little turtles. You'll love them. And so he sent them my way. When I first met him, which was to send me these two. And the reason that we connected on these two is these are uh, Cape Marsh Terrapins or uh, Eastern, Eastern Terrapins, sorry, which are from Zimbabwe, where I'm from. So these are two little African helmeted Terrapins, African uh, helmeted turtles. There's a whole bunch of names for them. Um, and they get big, they can be quite cheeky, but they're nondescript, they're little brown guys, but they have such personality and they're from Zimbabwe, where I'm from. So I fell in love with them and I, I wanted to keep them. My buddy Mike Lorette sent me this guy. This is a um, Indian spotted turtle, critically endangered in the wild, I believe, or definitely endangered. Uh, amazing, super fun animal. I got two of them together and the one grew super quickly and this one's been growing insanely slowly. So he's, uh, he's been staying with the babies. And then, in my opinion, the most underrated turtle in the entire world, the only reason it doesn't get more love is because uh, they're native and they're relatively common, but the Western painted turtle, I think are just one of the most stunning creatures in the whole world. And they're dirt common in the Midwest. Every lake, every puddle, every stream has these guys. And so they don't get the love and appreciation that a lot of the rarer turtles do, even though they're unbelievably stunning. So, and the last guy in here, there is also a baby Florida soft shell. He looks a lot like the leopard. And then the last sort of very interesting animal in here um, is this guy. Really new for me is Asian turtles, but I'm starting to learn more about them. This is my Vietnamese pond turtle. So apparently very common, especially in temples in Vietnam. I have seen them, but I didn't realize it when I was at those temples. And, um, and yeah, so these guys all live very happily in here. Um, and this is like, to me, this is better than television. Like I can sit on the couch right there and spend hours watching this tank and how active they are. You can see I've just literally just been handling them and they're still begging for food even right now. That's how like 
funny and silly they are. I mean, turtles are really like nature's D student. I don't even know how they survive in the wild. They're such daft little things as babies, but um, they are just unbelievably beautiful, full of personality and adorable. And I have three new turtles that'll be going into here very soon. I'll show you those guys when we get to the office. First, I'm gonna show you the adults. All right, so down here is the pond, and this is where the absolute adults go. Managed to set up a pretty cool in-ground filtration system. It's also got heating, so I can put tropical and temperate turtles in here. And there's a big mix. There's like this big giant uh, red belly slider here, who's, she was found walking around a street in Santa Barbara, which is insane, again, non-native. There's pink belly sliders. She's got a big chunk missing out of her shell. Um, I forget how that happened. There's like all kinds of things in here. Chinese hyphen sharks, there's some koi, almost all rescues. Um, and one of my absolute favorites, who I can see over there, they might come up, they might think I'm gonna feed them here, I don't usually feed them from the rock, are two of these guys, which are Batugar borneoensis, which are the Borneo Painted River Terrapins, which you may have seen them if you're a turtle guy, they get the crazy colors on their heads during breeding season. They are unbelievably cool turtles uh, that'll be really, really cool when they're adults, but right now I'll just show you. <laughs> this big gal right here, come here big guy. So this is the big female cooter that, uh, or red belly slider rather, that was walking around the streets of Santa Barbara when one of the rugby moms called me and said, there's a giant turtle on the road. And I was like, oh, it's gotta just be a native pond turtle. Of course it wasn't, it was this big red belly. Again, this was probably somebody's pet, escaped, walking around the streets, found her, brought her here, made sure she was healthy. And she's been living in this pond for about six years now. Um, big, funny, doofusy turtle. Crazy algae growth on her back, but the Placostomus and the Chinese algae eaters like to actually suck on and eat the algae off of her. So, lots of turtles in this house, in case you couldn't tell. Okay, all right, big girl. All right, so as you walk up the garden here, we got all kinds of great stuff. Lots of fruit trees, avocados, mulberries. I eat a million mulberries. Oranges, plums, nectarines, blah, blah, blah. And what at one point, um, was just a massive slope, has now become a pretty, I won't say well manicured, because it's very wild the way we like it, but pretty wild garden. Um, and at the top of this garden is a whole bunch more rescue animals. All right, so up here, all kinds of stuff going on. This is the temporary cages for the roosters, which are going away soon. Uh, they may or may not be going to a happier place, but we hatch chickens a lot, uh, trying to keep the diversity up for our chicken coops, and every now and then we get roosters. So, a bunch of different species of chicken. I'll be honest, I don't know most of them, my son does. We used to have our rescue pig buttons in there. She was a rescue from Hurricane Katrina. She was the sweetest pig in the whole world, but when was Hurricane Katrina? 2013? I don't know. So she sadly passed away of old age recently. Um, bunch more chickens over here. Everybody's out right now. We've got these guinea fowl. You can see the chickens just, they have a pretty nice life, everybody. They just kind of free range around, cruise around. We get beautiful fresh eggs every day. Um, I think we have peahens and baby peacocks in here right now, as well as some guinea fowl that you can see in there. They're usually free range, but because we're penning them, getting them used to the area before we let them out, they're staying in here for now. And then the two big sillies. So I'll let the two big sillies out right now. All right. The way we got these guys, again, never wanted them, never intended. Um, I was driving home from uh, Christmas at the in-laws and it was Christmas Eve. We're driving home to celebrate Christmas here at home with my family. And I looked and on the side of the road in Gilroy, California, was the sad looking mangy little pony um, that was up to here in muck and mud and it was raining, it was freezing cold. And I literally, I was in my old tiny little Mazda pickup truck and I pulled off the road and um, here sat this silly, silly horse. And so I pulled off and it turned out it was this uh, Spanish family who had a petting zoo. The petting zoo went under and this horse was the last animal they had. And so they said, oh yeah, she's an adorable little mare, such a sweet girl, blah, blah, blah. Um, we just haven't been able to take care of her. Earlier that day, I just pulled out a couple hundred bucks for everybody's Christmas presents. I had the whole stack of cash in my pocket. After a back and forth negotiation, we loaded Felice for Felice Navidad 
up into the bed of the pickup truck and drove him straight home to find out he was a he and not a mare. So that's how we got Felice. Donkey over here, and you see these two are inseparable. Donkey over here, um, he had a mate and they had been together their whole life and his mate died and Donkey was literally, hey Donkey, get your head out of there, would you? Dying of like, he's so stubborn, he's such a donkey. Ugh. He was like dying of a broken heart. He was getting skinny and miserable and sad. And we talked to the, the little miniature donkey farm in San Inez and they said, we don't know what to do. He's such a, such a sad case. We don't think he's gonna make it. And we said, let us try, let's see how he's doing. Felice needs a friend. We brought them together. Even though they're two boys, they have never been more than about six feet apart since then. So now they're just our uh, expensive mobile lawn ornaments, basically. <laughs> All right, and then as we leave the chicken and horse coop area down here, other unintended pets, um, but pets that we do love nonetheless, uh, we have our two giant African spurred tortoises, also known as sulcatas. So this is Arnie, and that's Sly and I actually grabbed some watermelon rind for them earlier. Let me get that. They also love hibiscus flowers, so where this hibiscus is growing over here, pick a couple of these, like this. Put some off the ground, bring them over here. A little bit of watermelon rind. They're pretty funny because what happened with them was there was an old lady who had them for years and years and years, and they got too big for her to take in and out every day any longer and so she didn't know what to do with them and like everything we couldn't not help them so they ended up coming over here and just growing gargantuan and they have one of the best views around as they live in this little area here eating our leftover veggies come buddy come when my son was little he used to sit on their back and ride them and uh, he thought that was hilarious but he's a little big for that now but each one of them probably weighs 70 or 80 pounds so they're getting Getting pretty beefy. <laughs> All right, now we are into my office, which in case you couldn't tell is a garage. And so this is where the sub-adult turtles go before they go out into the pond. Um, I've got a couple really cool animals in here. One of my favorite North American species, the spiny softshell. He is as aggressive as turtles get. He's just a total little jerk, but I love him nonetheless. Um, softshells, like all softshells, he likes to live and bury in the sand. So we have the nice soft sand. The larger Indian spotty that I mentioned from the baby tank. Um, one of my favorite species of turtle in the world, the yellow-headed Amazon river turtle, Podognemus unifilis. Um, very, very cool creature. Just so beautiful with those yellow spots. There's a red-headed cousin that uh, we met at the LA Reptile Super Show. Um, and that's really fun, actually. If you want to see it, go check out our Wild Times video on that. But that was super cool. I came this close to buying it. I'm glad I didn't, though, because they require a whole separate set of conditions and water that I didn't want to set up for. Um, a common map turtle. He's a, a rescue or northern map turtle, but uh, he's just been growing really slowly. He's adorable nonetheless. Two uh, toad-headed turtles. They like to hide, they're kind of jerks, but they're back here. Oop, that's not them, that's my, that's my favorite turtle. You'll see him next. These are the toad-headed turtles. Oh, that light came back on. Two of these beautiful South American toad-headed turtles. They're growing quick. They're probably gonna go in the pond by the end of uh, the summer. So one thing that's really interesting, actually, you can see it here, is we have two different kinds of turtles in the world, pleurodires and cryptodires. And so what that means is turtles that pull their necks straight in and turtles that bend their necks to the side, pleuro and crypto. Um, and it's pretty cool to see old world turtles that are side neck turtles versus new world turtles which uh, pull their heads in straight. So two different morphological adaptations, pleurodire and cryptodire, um, and two different ways of tucking in their shell, uh, which is really, really interesting. And when it comes to side neck turtles, I have my unbelievable animal here that I love more than pretty much any other pet ever, and that is my big old snake neck turtle. Um, so I've had this turtle for about 10 years. He really hasn't grown much. He's got this incredible 1.3 ratio of neck to shell. So his neck is literally longer than his shell. Um, I don't think I'll ever put him in the pond just because I would be devastated to not be looking at him most of every day, which is what I spend a lot of my time doing. Incredible predator, catches fish like you wouldn't believe. This insane long neck, I mean, I just love this turtle. Mwah. He gets to go back in here. Don't kiss your turtles, good way to get salmonella. And then I did mention that I also have some hatchlings, so ignore the mess. Wasn't planning on doing this today. 
come over here and this is the hatchling tank. So this is the most short-lived tank. This usually only goes for a couple weeks. I have two species in here, my Echinosterna, my vampire mud turtles. These guys, they're so small, you can still see their umbilical attachments. Um, these guys grow big. They're, I think they're the largest Echinosterna in the world, largest mud turtle in the world, so they get like that big. They'll be crazy predators. Not sure what I'm gonna do with them when they get big. And another very special turtle here, um, an Indian flap shell turtle. So you can see he's kind of like the soft shells, but he actually has a flap that closes here. So see that? So very, very unique. Um, the only Indian species. Oh no, I guess not the only Indian. I have the spotted Indians, but very, very cool to have a flap shell turtle. Absolutely adore that animal. And then over here, I have my beautiful fish tank, which in the back right now is hiding the Fly River Turtle. Now he doesn't hide very often. Since he was introduced into this tank, he's actually become very, very friendly. Here he comes actually to see us now. Uh, I would say the coolest species of turtle in the world. Truly like some kind of hybrid between a freshwater and a sea turtle. And uh, there he is right there. See, so he's actually got really friendly. Come out, buddy, come on. And uh, yeah, just amazing. So he lives in harmony with this beautiful fish tank, which I adore. And that, boys and girls, is the tour of our little farm and animals. They take way too much work. I would not recommend anybody get so many pets. Don't rescue everything. It's, it's hard on the heart, but it's even harder on the bank account. So hope you guys enjoyed.